let me jump right into this, but maybe say a few words about what the World Watch Institute is. I think we're the oldest kid on the block, as you say, in the United States. I think we're the oldest environmental think tank, at least that still exists. Uh, we were founded in 1974, and we were set up by the founder, Lester Brown, who some of you, I'm sure, will know, who's one of the really founding fathers of the environmental movement, for a very specific reason. Our task is to find solutions that are sustainable from a broad sustainability perspective. So not just from an environmental perspective, uh, decreasing emissions, decreasing pollution where it occurs, but also to find strategies that work socially and that work economically and that are to the benefit of the people. So I thought, Senator uh, Ivarez mentioned before uh, the, the importance of the national interest, or the interest of a community at whatever level you want to assess. That's what we are tasked with, and since 1974, we're trying to come up with those solutions, and I think in, in some areas we had some successes, and in others we had defeats, and this so far has been really a success story. When I was brought on board with the World Watch Institute four years ago, I was a climate negotiator for many years. I advised the German government. I'm German myself, not American. Um, when I was brought on board, I said, you know, that's great. World Watch has looked into how do natural gas and renewables work to together. We have, we have been following the global trends. But you know what we have to do is in a way what the energy system today has to become. We can't just do this 30,000 feet level centralized big scale planning anymore. We need to start going to the countries and do distributed and do de decentralized strategy building on the ground. We need to find partners in countries and we need to do this. So that's what I've tried to do for the last four years or so. Um, so you know, I wrote down some of those current problems and I think some kind of current encouragements in the Philippines. And I want to really mention that you know your country much better than I do. I'm in the Philippines for the first time. I was in the, the Asian region here before, but I haven't been in the Philippines. So I'm going to come to this later for us. One of the main reasons why I'm here is to reach out to you and find the right partners we can work with. So I'm not here to tell you what you should do. I'm here because I think we can bring some international experience to the table. We have found a methodology that is, has worked very well elsewhere. And if, but only if, there is an interest here in doing this kind of work in the Philippines, then we need to identify partners here in the country. And whatever project comes out of this here in the Philippines, I can promise you it's a 50% plus Filipino project because that's how we work. We're a relatively small organization. We go to countries, we identify partners there, and then we work with them governmental partners, academic partners, think tanks, NGOs, depending on really who wants to work with us and who, who is well positioned to contrib contribute to this. But of course, you know, there's really four main areas of problems. Number one is climate change. And most of you probably know this. Um, the Philippines have already been hurt by a number of changes in the climatic systems. The United Nations same things. it's the sixth country in the world that's the most threatened by climate change. And if we talk about climate change so often, we talk about something happening you know, in a few generations. While it will hit the hardest then, of course these changes, we see them already everywhere. And they have been documented for this country as for many others. So this is a major problem. I'm going to speak mostly about the electricity system or about the energy system in a broader sense. And there's important lessons to be learned here. Distributed power systems cannot be hurt as much by climate changes as centralized energy systems, whether that is storms, whether it's side, uh, sea level rise, whether it's floods. They are just uh, a way, actually, to adapt to climate change. And at the same time, obviously, as low carbon energy systems, they help mitigate climate change and prevent maybe the worst of the worst, as much as we can still prevent it. And then secondly, there is energy poverty in many regions uh, already of the Philippines, uh, still of the Philippines, though there have been amazing progress has made over the last decades. 17% um, from my numbers, you prob might have more updated one, but 70% of 16 million people nationwide still live without uh, access to modern electricity ser uh, services, and then there are some uh, provinces and some regions that are have even higher number of, uh, of people without this access yet. So I think that's a second challenge that the, the government has uh, discovered. It's not for me to tell you this. This is a, a key challenge. A third key challenge is the high dependence on fossil fuels. 
despite the fact that uh, the Philippines are really a worldwide leader on renewables already, uh, there are enormous additional potentials, and I'm going to talk about them on the next slide, I think, uh, for producing electricity here at home as your own resources. 10% of the GDP, up to 10% of the GDP, if my numbers are right, over the last few years have been used for the import of fossil fuels. And while this creates a lot of wealth here in the country, it is 10% of money resources that are shipped out of the country. And we believe that this hurts the Philippines in the long term. And then finally, uh, there's the use of fuel wood where there's some smarter ways maybe to uh, address it, not just with electricity instead of fuel wood, but just with a more sustainable use of fuel wood. So overall, in many countries of the world, this is not unique to the Philippines, in many countries where we've worked, we do believe that the current status of the electricity system is unsustainable and it's not just from a climate perspective that's an important part but it's also from an economic and a social perspective unsustainable um, but there is important encouragements and I mentioned the first one already uh, it's really uh, uh, the, the the Philippines are really a renewable leader already on geothermal on hydro energy but then there's enormous potentials in other areas and I'm very very impressed by your presentation before you have discovered them and you are very ambitious particularly about wind from what I see also geothermal and also hydro I would love to discuss some of this maybe in a in a meeting next week that we could have uh, more in detail what you're planning there is it run of the river is it small hydro how do you address some of the other issue areas like electrification because I think we've made a number of very important experiences there so solar and wind are at the current point really underdeveloped and geothermal growth has stagnated in recent years though so it's an important source you know, for uh, base load power. So it's not intermittent like wind and solar. So it can be used in that way. Um, and then there's enormous unused uh, potentials for energy efficiency. Senator Alvarez, of course, has a long history in talking about this issue area. Uh, you know, so often it's said that the best, the cheapest energy source is energy efficiency and energy savings because you don't have to produce it at all. So this needs to be part of, of the mix. Um, and then What's also very encouraging is just the presentation that we've just seen. There is political commitment, there's political willingness. I think the basic uh, information is already out there. So in, in addition to, to where the government stands and its willingness to really do something about it, it seems to me you have in the Philippines a country that is far further along than many other countries where I'm working. In terms of having understood the, basic, the basics of this, the basic socioeconomics, uh, and, and you have a country, I think, where you have a lot of people who are really technically savvy. So if we talk about smart grids, if we talk about the grid systems of the future, if we talk about ultra-modern electricity services, if we talk about metrological forecasting as an important part of this, this is all here. And maybe it has to be further developed and there has to be additional investment in building human capacities uh, as well as resource capacities but you're starting from a very high level already. That's not necessarily the case in other places where I work. So, next slide, please. Uh, it's really what we think is what's important is a holistic approach. In many countries where we're working, and I'm really just learning where the Philippines stand here. So don't ask me where do you see us on this because I'm not just here to tell you what we are doing and what we believe we can do. I'm really here to learn a lot from you and to get an idea of what the current status is. But in many countries where we're working, it's a piecemeal approach. You have the engineers talking to the engineers, and you have maybe even not even all engineers. You have the, the wind producer talk to the wind producers. But it's not that these different technical, political, financial communities talk to one another. And this kind of integrated energy planning that you need, where you find a role for what technologies do you have. So where you, you look into the different technology solutions, where you know what socioeconomically is the smartest way for the nation as well as its individual uh, provinces to develop, where you, you have, where, you talk, where the people who know what technically is possible talk to the people who are supposed to do the financial investments, and finally the policy makers come up with the smart policies that make those investments happen. That's what's so often not working. Okay, so this is why we came up with, you know, this slide tells you what I spend at least 350 days, I get a little bit of vacation. Next week here in, in the Philippines, I take a few days off. But 350 days a year, this slide tells you what, what I'm doing. This is the 
what we think holistic approach that we have come up with that bring these different areas together. So we're starting usually with technical assessments and we're looking into energy efficiency potentials that exist and potential of different renewable energy sources as well as the grid solutions. Um, you know, very often people look at a wind map and they say, oh, you have a lot of wind here up in the northeast. Well, it might not be where you need it because if you transport it from there all the way down where you have the load centers, you have to invest in the grid, you lose a lot of electricity by transporting it. So even within this one component alone, obviously you need to look into an integrated approach. Uh, secondly, we do socioeconomic assessments and I'm gonna show you some slides about this uh, later, so I don't wanna go into the detail at this point. We're doing financial and investment assessments, what investments do already happen, why are they not, if, if the potentials are so great, and we can all agree on that this is the smarter way to develop in the long run, why don't these investments happen yet? So we're looking into what are these barriers, and then at the very center of it is of course what makes uh, these investments happen, what uses those potentials, based on the understanding what's best for a country or, uh, or, or a province, and those are the policies that are needed. Throughout the world, World Watch Institute is doing, I don't know whether you're familiar with uh, the Global Status uh, Report for Renewable Energy that REN21 puts out. It's the most referenced guide, really, on renewable uh, energy trends, markets, and policies. And we're not very visible in this role, but we are, we are uh, uh, contributing to it in, in, in a lead authoring role. Uh, and we see it throughout the world, wherever successes have been made, it's a policy-driven approach. And why that is, we can maybe discuss a little bit more over lunch. It is not because renewables are more expensive in the long run from a social perspective. It is because we have invested into fossil fuels for 150 years. If we look into the subsidies for fossil fuels, they are still higher for renewables. So it's mostly you need those policies to create a, a plain level playing field. Next slide, please. So these are some of the countries where we work with different intensity at different levels. In India and China, for example, we're working at the uh, provincial, level, provincial level, at the state level, because the countries are too big, they're just too homogeneous. Um, from our perspective, it makes sense to set these overall targets at the national level, which the Chinese and the Indian governments with their different missions or five-year plans have done already. But the implementation and the concrete solutions need to happen in smaller entities. Uh, very different in Central America. Uh, we have uh, the full, full-fledged national roadmaps coming out over the next month. Uh, Jamaica in July still, then in August uh, Haiti, and then in September the Dominican Republic. Uh, long, massive projects with many, many partners. It's really implementing this full, the full four components that I showed you before. Uh, but we're also working for CARICOM there, for their 15 uh, member countries. We have helped them to set targets for the first time in the whole Caribbean uh, for renewable energy and energy efficiency and going now to the next phase with them about implementing those targets. How can you reach them? Uh, we are in the seven countries of Central America. And one of the reasons why I'm here is I've been invited by the ADB to present this, uh, uh, this, uh, this methodology this week at the ADB uh, Asia Clean Energy Forum. Um, but the key reason for us is really we're now trying to identify the new, the next countries where our methodology can be helpful. So that's what I'm trying to get out of this trip here. Next slide, please. Before I show you some few features from the different assessments that we have done, I wanted to, you know, I, don't, I know we have limited time, so I, I wanted to make sure that some of the key insights from our work throughout all the regions I can share with you. So here they are. Uh, we have understood that the strategy of change is not for us to go to a country, look what's there, go back, write our report, present it to the government. Okay. What's really key and our key has become our key strategy of change is to use the local knowledge and to create local ownership for the projects. I mentioned this before already, um, uh, that 50% that plus of this project are, is going to be done by Filipinos, not by, not by us. Um, so that's the one thing. And the other is, I call it a sandwich strategy, I don't know, you're all getting hungry already, uh, whether that's the right term <laughs> to, to call, but it's basically, why do we call it a sandwich strategy? Because we do believe we have to come from the top and from the bottom to really create change. The delicious thing about a, a sandwich is always in the middle, you know, that's, that's how you get to it. And you have to come from the top and from the bottom. So in other words, 
it's not enough to work just with governments. You need to create a, create a communication program. You need to create, you need to communicate to the media, uh, to uh, uh, academia, but really in the broader sense to the general public why you are doing this. Otherwise, you're not going to be successful, and this is going to end up as a report on a shelf. Secondly, the technological solutions. I mentioned that already before. It's all in the mix. Let's not think about geothermal being the big savior of the Philippines. Let's not talk about everything can be energy efficiency and the rest we do with fossil fuels. Let's be smart and use the different technologies that are at hand and figure out what's the smartest way to integrate them. Uh, so short and long-term energy integrated energy planning is of course key. Socioeconomically, again, you need a a paradigm change. BAU, business as usual, just continuing the way we've done it in the past, is not the cheaper way. So while climate change is a very, very important component of all of this, there is a socioeconomic reason why we need a transition in the countries that don't have fossil fuels. The business as usual as it is, that is the luxury path. There's no doubt about it. And I'm going to present some numbers to you about this. So you do need this paradigm change in, in people's thinking, not looking at renewables and thinking, you know what, great to have, you know, good thing for the rich, you know, but we can't afford it. The truth of the matter is, and I'm going to show you some, some, some numbers, the truth of the matter is, it's the other way around. If we continue on this path, we're going to hurt ourselves economically. Um, and then there is a need for a capacity building in the financial and the political sectors it's not just about new institutions. It's not just about new policies. It is really about, and this is a, a challenge, that for example in the United States where I live, is a giant challenge that has been recognized far too late by the universities. You need the university programs to create the engineers to make this all happen. You know, because otherwise you're gonna get stuck with goals alone uh, and you don't have the people to implement it. Um, one size does not fit all. You know, there's a lot of discussion in the U.S. right now. Do we go for an emission trade or do we go for carbon tax? And everybody is in their camp. And, you know, and then the Germans come over, like me, and say, you should do a feed and tariff. It's much smarter, you know. No, 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 no. It's every country has to find its own regulatory fit. Uh, policies that on paper might look perfectly and that have worked in other uh, countries and circumstances do not necessarily work everywhere else. Uh, but having said that, there is an available tool of tested policies. We are much further along than where we were 10 or 20 years ago. We have seen carbon taxes in many countries of the world. We have seen eco-taxes. We have uh, experience with carbon trading, feed-in tariffs, renewable portfolio standards, net metering, some of the things that you are already planning to do or are already doing. And so while there is no one-size-fits-all, at the same time you can learn a lot from lessons learned in those countries on about how to design it and so then the second step is how do you make this happen in your regulatory environment and then I'm very happy to have heard this already before in the presentation you know of course it's important to measure and report and verify and be transparent about your policies for different reasons to win the public over uh, to be successful but at the same time for example because it's simply a condition to get international financing so this is an important part of it, and that includes then things like stakeholder hearings, bringing stakeholders in, uh, mainstreaming between the different governmental uh, uh, departments, always a problem in every country, you know, who has a say on what, do the other departments really stand behind the targets, uh, does everybody stand behind the targets, do you have the top governmental officials, as well as those that execute the policies behind this, and most importantly, you know, I'm in the countries that I quoted before, I spent the last three years of my life there. Uh, I had a, a more than 200 travel days last year, and I'm paying a toll for it. <laughs> and I'm only doing this because I have a hope that these things get implemented. A plan that ends somewhere on a, on a shelf is not the goal here. The goal is, of course, implementation. Okay, so uh, just a few insights. I don't have enough time because we agreed on 20 minutes or so. Uh, to walk you through all the different things in countries, but, but you know, just snapshots of our work. Uh, we work with a company that's called Three Tier that does meteorological assessments for wind and solar. They're using historic data that goes back 30, 40, 50 years to come up with wind patterns and solar pa patterns throughout the country. So while this is a very helpful tool, it shows you the potential for solar, 
in, in Haiti, one, one specific indicator, global horizontal irradiance, and you see that you have fabulous potential throughout the country, you know, much better than in many of the current uh, solar leaders, United States, Germany, and we're, we're very proud to be solar champions, but if you look at the potential in Germany compared to this, it would all be blue or green. Okay. So you have uh, an amazing potential. So why this is a, is a great tool to show to people overall what the potential is, of course, for this kind of detailed, integrated energy planning that I was talking about before, that's not enough. So a very important first step. The next slide, please. This is really what this is about, okay? And this is only for one specific technology. It's, get, it's getting a lot more complicated after this. But this is the next step. And what you see here is, uh, the, the load curve. So when is electricity being, uh, being used? In this case, in, 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 in Jamaica. Uh, at, at what time of the day? Uh, somewhat unlikely curve in this case, by the way. You know, in, in other countries, uh, more northern climates, for example, you have electricity, of course, at night, very far down because there's no air conditioning, very few industry runs, and then through the day, you, you go much higher. So every country has a very different profile, of course, when electricity is needed and for what applications. And what the left one get, uh, shows you is different wind regions, different wind zones that we have looked into in Jamaica. And you see that it's not that you always have wind in the morning and never in the evening. To the contrary, it is very dif different throughout the region. So this is just the first step where we, where we go from this then. The next thing is we're going, we're having the same curves for solar energy. Okay, and then we're overlaying that with the load profile. And only through that we're coming to really smart, uh, a really smart uh, uh, approach to figure out how best to deal with the intermittencies. So, in fact, in the Dominican Republic, for example, we're not saying put all of your wind in the, in the south uh, east where you have the, the most potential for it. You might want to go for some areas where you still have really good potential. Uh, but which is closer to the load centers, and when, when these curves are more in line uh, with, with your load curves. So it's this kind of uh, uh, analysis that we're doing together with 3-tier. Uh, and you know, you were talking al already about your geothermal potential, your hydro potential, so I would be really interested at, at you know, how, how detailed this is. Uh, is there a need to do this? Most of this is not done by ourselves. We tell the story, we communicate it, we work with the policymakers on which zones they want us to assess, but it's really technical work that 3 tier doesn't. If this already exists, fabulous, you know, we can take already two steps forward. Next slide, please. So, this is the paradigm change I'm talking about, okay? I don't know who of you is familiar with um, electricity modeling, uh, but there is a common, widely accepted way to do this, which is called levelized cost of electricity. So that's the LCOE without the plus. And in many regions of the world where we do these assessments, particularly those that don't have fossil fuels, and amongst those particularly the island states, because they pay so high costs for the import of fossil fuels, even if you don't bring the externalities in, I'm talking about which ones they are in a moment, but even if you don't bring them in, over the course of the life cycle of electricity sources. Installment costs are something else, okay? But if you take installment cost, costs, plus operation and management costs of different plants, plus the fuel costs that you have for the fossil fuels, then renewable resources already come out cheaper as the cheaper way over the course of, say, a 30-year period, okay? Now, what we are doing in our work is we're saying there's a problem. This, we have a distorted market. You know, of course, this looks different if, at the same time, polluters don't pay for the pollution they cause. Of course, this looks different if the societies as a whole pick up the cost for healthcare, for example, which are very real costs that taxpayers pay for. They're real social costs, but they're not reflected in the market. So we do a two-step analysis. We first look into this without the so-called so externalities, and then we we uh, give numbers to local pollution, we give numbers to healthcare costs, and we also give flexible numbers to climate change. Okay, so you can do this at different levels because it's a very complicated discussion. You know, what's really the price of a, of a ton of, of carbon? You know, is it 10 or is it 50 or is it $100 or even far more than that? 
So, so we're somewhat flexible there, and we tell the story with and without climate change costs. I'm not going to go through uh, the details of this, but in the case of Jamaica, for example, you see that hydro is by far the, uh, uh, the, the cheapest uh, source, and the second one, second cheapest is already wind, and you have then large-scale PV at about the same level as natural gas. Okay, so this is a story that we're trying to tell a lot these days because, again, so many people look at renewables as a far more expensive solution and, and, and these numbers, it's, it's a World Bank model that we're using. It's just going to be uh, 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 launched by the World Bank later this year where the, we were the, the first ones and the only ones to use it so far and through implementing it, we've learned a lot about it and helped them a little bit to fine tune it. So this is, this is a, a, a lot of my presentations these days are uh, uh, about the story behind this. Next slide, please. So this shows you the total investment that you would have to do to, to meet annual demand. And this slide is a very important one because what it shows you, these are different, you probably can't see this from the back and I'm not going into the details of it, but you show business as usual, needs this much new investment per year and then you 20% renewables, this much investment per year, 30%. 50%, 70%, and this is our top, our highest uh, scenario, 94% renewables in 2030. So the annual investment costs are a lot higher than if you just go uh, business as usual, okay? But this is the total cost of electricity, including operation and management, and including the, fossil, the, the, the fuel costs, uh, and including externalities. Um, and you see, this is the real price that Jamaicans are going to pay per year for the electricity system. So while the investments are lower that are required, the overall cost of the electricity sources in business as usual are, uh, um, uh, are, a, lot, are a lot higher. So they go down depending on how much more renewable um, you're going to implement because there's no fossil fuels. Jamaica is even in a worse situation than the Philippines, pay up to 20% of the GDP for the import of fossil fuels, 20%. So here you have the total savings of different energy scenarios over business as usual. And you see how much money is, money is saved every year. So we're producing this, we have produced these numbers for Jamaica and the next ones are Haiti and the Dominican Republic. I, can, I really cannot wait until I see them and our model is come out with them. So um, yeah, I, I, I wanna leave some, first of all, you're sure hungry by now, and secondly, I wanna leave some time for discussion later because I said I also want to learn a lot from being here, um, and not just not just lecture. But but these are some of our key findings uh, from the financial component. So we've looked into renewables, we've looked in socioeconomic, now now comes financial and, and, and policy, and it's really you have this high installment cost versus the low uh, uh, the low uh, uh, life cycle cost, and finances and financial reform and policy reform need to address this problem. Of course, money is short everywhere. You know? So you need to find a way to, to address this. It's a key, the key challenge. Finding the right project sponsors at the right scale. You know? So you can do a lot with private industry in countries where electricity prices are relatively high to do household level PV. But if we're talking about large scale investments and a lot of banks I'm talking to, both the international banks and the commercial banks say like, you know, anything that's cheaper than $50 million, I'm not even turning the pages, you know? So in a way, it's a problem that some of these decentralized, smaller scale resources are so cheap because they just simply don't interest the banks, okay? So here, project bundling, for example, there's a number of ideas out there that have been, have been working, a very important component of this. Um, often you have an underperforming domestic banking sector. So the policies are being changed, but the banks are three, five, ten years behind in understanding how much money can really be made. So the government or actors like we can play a mediating role here in really showing, having, having banks see the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the benefits of investments. Uh, many projects are not finished on time or on budget. That's hurting renewables, energy efficiency, sustainable energy solutions overall, because people point out to, see, it's not working. So it's good if a government is aware of this and tries to set realistic time frames uh, rather than overly ambitious ones. Um, and then uh, there is really the, the, the need for, for regulatory systems or financial me mechanisms that encourage the financing. I mentioned that before already. Next slide, please. Uh, 
Often there are bureaucratic hurdles. I'm going to show you a slide in a moment that, that uh, shows that very well. Uh, often renewable investments, obviously, or energy efficiency investments do not take place in a vacuum. You know? But if we're talking about at least international investors, but even domestic investors, it is about, it's about the general investment climate in, in a country. Okay? And so that can hurt it even if you have great potentials. Okay. But then there's a lot of countries that have, have overcome that. Nicaragua, for example, which I think has an investment climate ranked at about 150 in the world, is now the number two country in Central America uh, done by a study by IDB in terms of an investment climate. So there's ways to overcome this by the government backing up deals, uh, by, by, many other, by many other measures. And geothermal, by the way, is, is why Nicaragua is uh, ranked so high. So you have this potential here as well. So, the credit worthiness of a country, the indebtedness, can be overcome by specific uh, measures. It is a problem, but it can be overcome. And, and finally, um, often we do see that there's a lack of institutional capacity to apply for international finance. Okay, so very often uh, the knowledge is lacking about what, what are CDMs, what are NAMAs, you know, how do, how do I, you know, what's the Green Climate Fund, you know, how do I get how do I get a hold of this? And I'm sure Senator Alvarez and his commission do great work in this area, but you know, very, very often those potentials are not really being seen. Next slide. I'm not going through this slide, uh, and you probably can't even see it in the back. We have developed a methodology to assess for what barriers exist in a country. So these are all barriers that exist uh, in, ter in terms of a lack of policies, in terms of a lack of finance, entrenched interest, existing infrastructure and we we have coupled them with the necessary enablers that help you move these barriers out of the way i can't really go through this in detail right now but it is really it shows you in one picture whatever barriers you have there's usually ways to overcome them okay this is what i was talking about before i think is is click i'm getting too close to my last slide often even if you have the long-term vision so the goals in place and the overall strategy in place that is so important as much more than just throwing out a number. It puts the whole country on a certain trajectory. And if you have the concrete policies in place, in many countries where we've worked, this part is where it's not working. So you have the goals, you have the policies or measures, but then, you know what this shows you? This shows you the stages that uh, a renewable energy investor, a project developer in the Dominican Republic has to go through to make a project happen. And we are talking to project developers that started this process in 1999, and they are not yet through it, okay? So you imagine how much technology alone has changed since 1999. So even in, if finally they hear about this project, you can do it, they have to start the whole process again because they're not working with the same technology anymore. So these are 14 steps a project developer has to go through. And all these steps are there for a reason, but there is a way to streamline it. There is a way to make six out of 15, okay? And there's a way for the government to actively take project developers, if you want so, by the hand and walk them through this. So for example, one window administ uh, administrative go-to point, you know, uh, where the government plays an active role rather than being a hurdle and running through Again, I'm not saying this, I'm speaking about other countries. I have no idea how, it, how this looks like in the Philippines as of today. But this is a major, major problem because this is what makes particularly small projects unattractive. If I have to invest five years into bringing my projects through it, you know, and rest time and money to go through all of this, it's just, it just overall, it's not at the, at the level of return that it is worth it. So here, very often in countries, is a really key lesson learned. A lot of changes can happen here. Uh, next slide. This is a slide that's specific to the Philippines. This is, I mentioned this before while we're here. Um, we're trying to find out and identify appropriate islands and communities. Uh, there's many, many different ways to do it. With the hundreds or I think even thousands of islands you have in the, in the Philippines, there's no way we can make a roadmap for every individual island at the same time. So which ones do you pick? Do you pick the ones where you have the highest renewable potential? Do you pick the ones where you know ele the electrification rate is the lowest? Uh, do you pick different ones across the Philippines to come out with representative examples so that neighboring islands can kind of follow this lead? Uh, 
So this is one of, one of the reasons. Then finding the right partners. It's really about reaching out to governments. When I go to Jamaica, or the Dominican Republic, or Haiti, or Central America, or India, the only way I can be successful is that the government trusts me. Okay, so that's why I'm here, to offer these services. But I tell you what, if there's no interest, I'm leaving next week, uh, Sunday, and, and, and you're not gonna see me again. It's really, it's not us intruding. We wanna show what we can do, and, and if you and your home governments are interested in working with us, then we can start talking what's the most helpful for you. Okay, what, what are the areas you think uh, uh, support can be most needed? And the same goes for lo local organizations. We're interested in who you think are the key think tanks, NGOs, universities that have done work already in this area uh, that I can start talking to. Uh, and of course, funding is, a, is, 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 a, is a, always a key problem. Where's the money? Um, lucky enough, there's an ADB meeting this week, and uh, Senator Alvarez and I have a number of meetings set up already with ADB, USAID, Chica. Um, so I'm, I'm hoping we can find the same interest there that I'm hoping I'm finding with you. So the next slide is the final one. I'm not asking you to revolt. Uh, uh, the, this is the name of our blog. Uh, so everything I've told you about, we're reporting on on the on the revolt uh, blog. And uh, there's a basic study where I'm explaining uh, really what the roadmaps are in, 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 in a little bit more of a detail than, than on these four pages. Um, and uh, it's, it's on our website and it's accessible for free. Um, so uh, thank you, Senator Alvarez. Thank you to the government of the Philippines. Thank you all for, for coming here from, from far away and to listening to me. And I'm hoping we can uh, work together on this. Thank you.